When people talk about the birth of punk, there's two bands that are constantly brought up as potentially being the first punk band, and I think of those two, the Stooges get all of the attention. I'll probably end up doing a video about the Stooges eventually, but first I wanted to talk about the story of the lesser known foundational punk band. So this is the story of MC5. If you enjoy these videos and want to support the channel, the best way to do that is still to like, subscribe, share this video with a friend, just kind of boost it in the algorithm. But if you want a more direct impact on this channel, I did set up memberships through the YouTube channel. You I can't recommend that you do that. It's like three bucks a month. You don't really get a ton. You'll get early access to the videos. You'll get shout outs at the end of the videos. You can decide for yourself if that's worth it. Hopefully, eventually, I'll be able to offer more actually really good incentives with that membership. But right now, I just don't have the time to do that. But I think the biggest incentive is just the knowledge that you are making a direct impact on this channel. If we get enough memberships, I'll be able to improve the lighting, improve cameras and microphones, and maybe even hire an editor one day. So if you want the videos to get better, that's like the best way to make a direct impact on that. So it's there if you care. You don't have to, you probably shouldn't. And then one disclaimer before we get started on this video, I'm mostly covering the early days of MC5. I know there were various reunions and different formations of the band, but I'm talking about primarily that first period of MC5. Well In 1948, Wayne Stanley Combs was born in Detroit. When he was younger, Wayne's father, who was a World War II Marine veteran, suffered from alcoholism and abandoned the family. Because of that abandonment and combined with abuse from his mother's new husband, Wayne's early life was really rough. By the age of 10, Wayne was shoplifting from local convenience stores, and he later said, quote, My mother was a wonderful woman who showed me a lot of love, but not having a man in the picture left a big hole for me. End quote. He also changed his last name to Kramer in order to distance himself more from his father who he felt abandoned him. While Wayne was going through all of that as a kid, he also discovered music. He'd hear Chuck Berry on the radio or local artists on a jukebox and just became really attracted to the idea of playing music. He said in his memoir, quote, It sounded unearthly, magical, powerful. I wanted to play the guitar like that. End quote. So he saved up his allowance money and bought himself a guitar so he could start learning how to play it. That rough upbringing also helped him become friends with his neighbor, who also suffered abuse as a kid, named Fred Smith. Wayne actually met Fred when he started asking around their school, asking for people who might be interested in joining a band, and some people said to talk to Fred because he played the bongos, and Wayne thought every good band needed a bongo player. Frederick Smith was actually born during an electrical storm in Lincoln County, West Virginia, but the family moved to Detroit when he was still really young, when his father found work at a factory. Fred started playing guitar when he was 12, and he met Wayne when they were both 15. During a talk at the Detroit Artist Workshop, Wayne said that he had just moved into the neighborhood and, quote, everyone was telling me about this juvenile delinquent who played bongos, even a little guitar. The delinquent turned out to be Fred Smith. End quote. They became really good friends since they both shared a hatred of authority figures and just a general cynicism about everything in life. Wayne would bring his guitar over to Fred's house almost every single day and teach him how to start playing some like rudimentary chords. When Wayne was a teenager, he looked around and all he saw was adults working dead-end jobs at factories to make ends meet, and he realized he didn't want that for his life. He said, quote, when I was a teenager, the idea of spending the rest of my life in a factory was real depressing. So the idea that I could become a musician opened up some possibilities I didn't see otherwise, end quote. Wayne and Fred both started to join and start little garage bands around the neighborhood. Wayne became a guitarist in a band called Bounty Hunters, and Fred was leading the Vibratones. Fred also bought a Fender Duo Sonic guitar, which even though he didn't really like the sound of it, he liked the name, so he kept it and became known as Fred Sonic Smith. As is often the case with these kind of teenage high school garage bands, members filtered in and out as different people took it more or less seriously or even graduated and went off to college. 
So eventually things just kind of coalesced around Wayne and Fred as the two constant members and the people who were taking it the most seriously. Around 1963 or 1964, they decided to team up and start their own thing with Wayne playing guitar and Fred playing bass. Fred said about that decision, quote, we used to play a lot of the same kind of gigs, little neighborhood parties and at the junior high school. When my band play, he'd go see us, and when his band would play, we'd go and see them. Finally, we got together and got talking about it. We got the idea to take the best members from each band and form a new band. They also had Billy Vargo on guitar and Leo LaDuke on drums. When they started playing some gigs and actually earning a little bit of money, they thought they needed a manager to kind of help them organize the business side of the band. That's how they met Rob Tyner. Rob was born Rob Derminer in 1944, which made him a few years older than the other guys, and he had started going by Rob Tyner, taken from jazz pianist McCoy Tyner. Wayne met Rob through Rob's younger brother, and Wayne really had to convince Rob that it was a good idea to be in a rock band. Wayne recalled in the book Grit, Noise, and Revolution, quote, he would tell me none of that was hip. It was all passe. Jazz is really where it's at. So he introduced Wayne and Fred to jazz musicians of the more aggressive avant-garde variety, and that really impacted MC5 sound. Billy Vargo and Leo LaDuke didn't last all that long, and Wayne actually joined on bass while Bob Gaspar joined on drums. Even though there were only four of them at the time, they started going by Motor City 5 because they thought that 5 sounded cooler than 4. Eventually, Rob wasn't all that happy on bass, so he left the band and he was replaced by Pat Burroughs, but Rob came back in as the singer, finally giving the band five members. And then Rob suggested they shorten the name to MC5 because it kind of sounded like a car part, and they became MC5. After playing a few gigs, the band started to notice a new direction opening up for them. Detroit was a city where people worked really hard, and they wanted to party just as hard. So MC5 realized that instead of playing the Rolling Stones type of music or the slower psychedelic stuff coming out of San Francisco, they should turn the amps up really high and just blast people with aggressive music. Turns out that Bob and Pat weren't all that keen on that new direction, so they left the band in 1965 and 1966, which left Wayne, Fred, and Rob as the only members of MC5, but with a clear direction of where they wanted to go. So they started looking for people to fill those holes. For bass, they turned to Michael Davis. Michael was born in Detroit and was always more interested in folk music growing up. When the MC5 were getting started, he was studying painting at Wayne State University. After attending a Bob Dylan concert, he started playing guitar. Michael said, quote, He was just playing guitar, sitting on a stool all by himself, and it took hold of my life. I decided that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a musician, end quote. Michael already knew Wayne from school. The two of them would kind of hang out and play Beatles songs together, and he was also aware of Rob in general because Rob was kind of like a big voice in the underground community. So when he heard that the MC5's bassist had left, he asked if he could start playing with the band. Despite the fact that he had never actually played bass and didn't really consider himself much of a musician at that point, he still went out, bought a bass, and taught himself how to play it. On the other hand, the drummer that they got, Dennis Thompson, had been playing drums since he was six years old. His older brother was in a band, so Dennis would play the drums while they were on a break, and soon he was playing with his brother at weddings and different little gigs around the area. He briefly played with Wayne in that Bounty Hunters band that I talked about earlier. When he was a junior in high school, Wayne came by his house to ask him to join the band. Dennis recalled that incident, saying, quote, Wayne came by my house on his motorcycle one night and asked me to play in this bar, and I did. I joined, and from that point on, I was in the band." End quote. Now fully formed with a musical direction in mind, the band needed a place to play, but back in the 60s, there weren't too many venues who were ready for their high-energy, explosive sound. They were even struggling to find a place to rehearse. They heard about this thing called the Artist Workshop, started by John Sinclair, who was a poet and political activist, who was also already kind of a hero for Rob because Rob loved his political writings. John's Artist Workshop provided a place for bands to rehearse. To make a long story very short, the Detroit Artist Collective and Artist Workshop was basically a loose collection of avant-garde artists who were dedicated to advancing the art scene in Detroit, and since most of those artists were also hippies, it was a pretty political organization. So the band went to practice there, and John overheard them. It was probably pretty hard to not overhear them based on how they played, and John was immediately interested. He kind of got what they were doing right away. In 1966, Russ Gibb, who was a local radio DJ who had just opened a new bar called the Grandi Ballroom, 
called John and asked if he knew of any bands. He particularly wanted bands that were playing their own songs. John immediately recommended MC5, and they became the house band at the Grandy Ballroom. Playing at the Grandy allowed MC5 the artistic freedom to work on their own songs. At this point, bands were expected to play mostly cover songs, and you could sprinkle in a few of your own originals. But Russ wanted something completely different. He wanted something like the Fillmore in San Francisco, where new unsigned bands were playing their exciting new music that was all original. And that allowed MC5 to really focus on songwriting and crafting their own work. And getting plugged in with John Sinclair and the Artist Collective meant the band became more political than maybe they ever intended to be. John started getting them involved in all of these protests and demonstrations, some of which didn't end well for the group, like an event called the Love Inn, where a riot broke out between the police and the crowd while MC5 were on stage. But the band doubled down, and in 1967, they asked John Sinclair to be their official manager. John had never been a manager before, but he saw the drive that MC5 had and this desire to be the biggest rock band. He also saw how crowds reacted to them and realized he could use them as like a voice of the people to kind of fuel this revolution that he wanted. As Wayne said, quote, John Sinclair was the only person that we respected and whose direction we would accept. We had a long series of second-rate music business hustlers that were trying to manage the MC5. We were not manageable. We were barely sane. End quote. The band released a couple of singles that were never going to make it anywhere near the top 40 and continue to gain traction in Detroit as the house band at the Grandy. They became so popular that they started to outperform some of the national touring acts that would come play at the Grandy. They used to heckle some of the bigger acts and they would stand out in the audience and yell at the band's kick out the jams or get off the stage. As Rob Tyner said, quote, people of the world, the next time you see a live band and they go up there and do top 10 material or shuck around material, you ought to turn on them and say, play the music, either play the music or get off the stand. Tell them that, end quote. And that's how their slogan was born. They turned kick out the jams into a song that became a rallying cry for the rock and roll youth of Detroit. Because of the general unrest that was happening in the 60s in America, the band members found themselves getting more and more radicalized. They became increasingly more anti-establishment and militant in their frustrations. They started to be seen as hardened revolutionaries, and John definitely positioned them that way. But then they became too political for the grandee. As a form of protest, they planned on burning the American flag on stage, Russ Gibb heard about it and threatened them and said, you better not do that. So MC5, you know, they were amenable. They compromised and instead just ripped the flag to shreds on stage. After several arguments between Russ Gibb and John Sinclair, MC5 were kicked out of the Grandy and were no longer the house band. As the band kept getting bigger and getting more traction, they also started getting more attention from police and getting into more trouble. They were playing free shows in parks that they technically weren't allowed to play in, and John got them more involved in different protest movements. In 1968, the Democratic National Convention was happening in Chicago, and John signed MC5 up to be one of many bands playing a protest outside of the event. Most of the other bands backed out when they were warned that it could potentially be a dangerous and bad situation, but MC5 showed up and they played. And again, a riot broke out between the protesters and the police. That was the moment that a couple of members of the band at least started to get a little disillusioned about the revolution and wanted to focus on just playing music the way they did when they first started. John Sinclair got in touch with Danny Fields, who worked at Elektra. He was kind of like the eccentric at the label. He was the guy that convinced Elektra to sign the doors. Danny flew out to Detroit to listen to MC5, and he was immediately hooked. He got what they were doing. He thought that they could be a massive band. So he signed them to a deal and made plans to record their first album as a live album. Album at the Grandy. The MC5 also recommended that Danny take a look at their brother band, The Stooges, and Danny also signed The Stooges. So MC5 recorded their debut album as a live album, which is not something that bands typically do do, but it made sense for the MC5. Most of the power of the MC5 wasn't in the songs. It was in their live performance. So if you could capture that on an album, then you could have something really powerful and explosive. But it's notoriously hard to capture that live energy on an album, and when the band heard it, they were not thrilled. They thought it sounded terrible. As Wayne said, quote, there was too much distortion and a couple of screw-ups recorded, like when my string broke. I felt that we had material that had been recorded on much less sophisticated equipment that sounded better, 
end quote. They played a few shows on the East Coast and got into quite a lot of trouble. They kind of like partnered with this street gang that caused trouble at every show they played. And they got on the bad side of Bill Graham, who owned the Fillmore and was probably the most connected and big time venue owner in the country at that point. They got on his bad side and he essentially blackballed them from most of the major rock clubs in the country. Plus their album was getting a lot of pushback for being obscene since they used cuss words. I heard that apparently record store clerks were being arrested for even selling it. I don't know that that's true. I just read that somewhere. So not only were they being blackballed outside of Detroit, their record was also being pulled from the shelves. Not to mention they had also been introduced to drugs and several of them started to develop pretty serious heroin addictions. This time of finally getting signed to a major label and putting out your debut album should have been a really exciting time for the group, but it turned pretty dark. When John Sinclair heard that record stores were refusing to stock the album, he created this flyer that essentially said, if this store won't sell you the album, kick in the door and demand that they do, along with some other cuss words on it, of course, and he put Electra's logo on there, kind of implying that this flyer was created by and endorsed by Electra Records. So in response, a lot of the record stores pulled all of Electra's albums, not just MC5. So when John flew to New York to complain to the label head about the label censoring MC5's album, Electra just dropped MC5. They also fired Danny Fields, just in case. Danny got John a meeting with Atlantic Records, who agreed to sign MC5 and give them creative control over their albums. Maybe sensing that this was a second and kind of final chance, the band started to rethink their association with John Sinclair. As Dennis said, quote, it was veering from the music, and the music is what it was about. It was about rock and roll music. Sure, politics got us a lot of press, but we really wanted to be a big, big rock and roll band, not just Sinclair's personal political platform. We believed in politics and philosophy, but we didn't want to teach, end quote. They fired John right before he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for marijuana possession. In 1969, they set out to record their second album with the producer John Landau, who was a former writer for the Rolling Stone and future mentor and producer and manager of Bruce Springsteen. The MC5 album was basically John's first attempt at producing a rock band, and he was all in. The band also took it very seriously. The album called Back in the USA was way more toned down and commercial than their first album. It released in January of 1970 and was largely seen as a failure. It wasn't commercially successful, and it also alienated their core fans who had no idea what to make of the new direction. Those fans were also already annoyed at MC5 for what they saw as the band abandoning John Sinclair as he got put in prison and kind of giving up on the revolution. So when this album came out that was different from what they knew the MC5 to be, they were a little bit more confused and turned off by the whole thing. This was also when the band started to splinter internally. Up until this point, at least according to Wayne, he was the leader of the group. He said, quote, at the risk of breaking my arm to pat myself on the back, I really pushed the MC5. I really believed in the MC5. It was my vision, my idea, my future, end quote. But around this time, the rest of the band started to bristle against that leadership. He said that they started to realize the band wasn't going where they wanted it to go. They weren't seeing the success they probably should have by this point, and the band needed a scapegoat, so they just turned to him as the scapegoat. Later that year, the band got to tour Europe, where the audiences actually really enjoyed it back in the USA, so they got a much better reception over there than they did back home. Then they got back home and started to work on their third album. Released in 1971, High Time became the band's send-off. Several members of the band think it was the best record they ever made. Fred Sonic Smith was really growing as a songwriter and got to show that off a bit, and they had a producer who understood how to capture what they were going for. Despite making a solid album that they were all really proud of, the band splintered. They had already alienated their core fans who were annoyed at them for turning their back on the revolution and not being as political as they thought the MC5 were. They were also struggling to break into the more national commercial rock fans, partly because 
Atlantic Records wasn't supporting their albums as well as they could. And then just the accelerating drug use caused a lot of paranoia and tension within the group. The band really just didn't like each other anymore. As Michael Davis said, quote, everybody was on their own trips. We had no spirit as a group. It was such a burden to carry on the pseudo political torch, always having to defend ourselves, end quote. Michael slipped further and further into his heroin addiction. He even said at one point that being a drug addict was his full-time job. When the band went to play in England again, Michael took a separate flight and he was turned back at customs for having drug paraphernalia, so he missed their first show in London. When he eventually joined up with the band, they had a meeting and let him know that he had been fired. After MC5, Michael joined Destroy All Monsters with Ron Ashton of the Stooges and then played with several other bands like Empty Set and Rich Hopkins and the Luminarios. In the late 70s, while in jail on drug charges, he refound his love for painting. He passed away in 2012 from liver failure at the age of 68. Back in 1972, the Grandy Ballroom was closing and the MC5 played the final show on December 31st. Wayne was so caught up in his own drug addiction that he could only manage a couple songs before he walked off stage. By all accounts, it was a horrible show, maybe the worst MC5 had ever played. The band broke up not long after that. After the split, Dennis Thompson went out to LA to join another Ron Ashton group called The New Order that didn't last all that long, and then in the 80s he bounced around between a few different groups. He participated in the various MC5 reunions before he passed away a few months ago in April of 2024 from a heart attack at the age of 75. Rob Tyner stuck around music, forming a band that he called The New MC5 before it eventually changed into the Rob Tyner Group. He had plans to get a solo career back on the road when he suffered a heart attack in 1991 and passed away, leaving a wife and three children. Fred Sonic Smith formed Sonic's Rendezvous Band, a band that featured Scott Ashton, Ron's brother, and the drummer of the Stooges. They never saw any really big success and have had various periods of inactivity. While married to his first wife, he started an affair with Patti Smith. Him and Patty got married in 1980 and had two children together, one of whom married the drummer from the White Stripes. After being in poor health for a while, Fred passed away in 1994. According to reporter Legs McNeil, he drank himself to death. Wayne Kramer was arrested in 1975 for selling drugs to an undercover police officer. He spent four years in prison and then started a solo career when he got out. He moved to New York and briefly worked with Johnny Thunders on a project. Then he bounced around a few different projects while he worked as a carpenter in Manhattan. He did a lot of woodworking, a lot of moving around, and he worked as a producer before he passed away from pancreatic cancer in 2024. Asked to reflect on the legacy of MC5 and whether or not he thought they were a failure, both in terms of their commercial success and in terms of their revolutionary ideas, Wayne Kramer said, quote, I can't look at it as a failure. That's not a fair judgment to make. We came from nothing. We made this whole big stink. We do have a place in the story. The MC5, contrary to what MCV and the mainstream historians will tell you, has a place in the history of popular culture so it's not fair to say it was a failure. That's the story of the MC5. They were a band that truly changed rock and roll history by introducing aggressive, loud, fast music that had a political point to it. I think without MC5, the music landscape would look a lot different today. So let me know what you think about MC5, about this video in the comments below, anything I missed out on. Subscribe so you don't miss more stories like this from music history, and leave a like if you liked the video.